haven't got any further, can I just say one thing? Hi, hi. <laughs> I forget. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, um, uh, Jack, for inviting me. And uh, I want to say I'm pleased to to be here. And, uh, and we'd like you to meet a new member um, uh, who has been sitting with me there. He's 80 years old today. And he is, he doesn't look it. His name is Eric Ascot. Ascot. Uh, uh, give him a round of applause. Well, for the new member. So we, we ought to do a uh, happy birthday, but I'm not going to. No. Hello. <laughs> I eight kids. Anyway, it, 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 it is, uh, no, he's a quite nice lad. Um, we used to do that in a show, so don't frown, I'm going to say, because I used to say it in the show and, uh, about kids, but I really don't. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, must admit, I must admit, when I first went to the BBC many years ago, which is my friend who I'm introducing to at the moment, who directed uh, Dad's Army, when I first went, a year before, even before he was there, I went in, and the head of light entertainment then, I can't think of his name, you were invited in the office and, and I was sort of, I, I don't think I'm too bad now, you know, quite smart. And I, I, I went in and, uh, you know, really doled up and I thought, okay. And I went and he said, hello, bonus. I said, yes, that's me. You had to have an interview before they accepted you as an actor or, or a turn. And he said, uh, he said, are you, are you? he said, um, are you a feminine? I mean, I, I thought she, that, that is true, Jack. I'm glad you laughed. Anyway, he, said, he said, are you a feminine? I said, there's nothing effeminate about me, sir. I've never been near a woman in all my life. <laughs> but I've, uh, I've always been a bit of a looker, you understand what I mean? Uh, well, uh, that has been my, you know, really, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I, I say this with the greatest respect. It's so nice to see the ladies here today because I've never, in my younger day, I never used to get on too well with the ladies because I come out of racing. I was a jockey, very small, and, and people didn't understand me. And they, they thought that I was, you know, a little bit, um, <coughs> I suppose they did. And, 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 and uh, I was against the ladies at all. They didn't, because wine, women, and song killed my brother. Well, not so much the song, Birds and Booze killed him. He couldn't get either, so he shot himself. <laughs> I've always said, because I said, oh, you quite like that, didn't you? I quite like that, man. And, uh, and, uh, and a lot of people think I am a little bit, uh, you know, being a bit of a knocker in the, in the car. And the people thought, hello, because a lot, lot of people think I'm a bit that way, but I'm, I'm not. I'm, might help about when they're busy, but I was asked the other day, well, the other day, about 20 years ago, someone said to me, are you gay? Because that was a new expression. Are you gay? I said, I, I, said, I said, are you gay? I said, I'm not gay, I'm not even sodden happy. <laughs> I, I am, I, I'm going to tell you something about Dad's Army, and that is that many years ago, when it first started, I was doing the summer season at the Isle of Wight, where I am now. I've got a home there as well as in England. <laughs> I've earned some money through Harold Snow, and uh, uh, um, he used to book me a lot. And um, I was on the Isle of Wight, and I came back to do a, a, a television warm. I do a lot of warm-ups. I don't know if you know that. Uh, I do the chat before the shows, and uh, I was doing it on the Isle of Wight. I had to come up on a Sunday to do a warm-up for the BBC. And I, who should I bump into? It was Bill Pertwee, you know him, not a, not a nice looking man. And uh, in the, in the, and, and I was, he got on so well. And uh, he, he was in the, the um, uh, White City Underground. And hello, Bill. And I'd suggest him, because when you do a summer season, they all say, who can we have next year? And you'd suggest people. Well, I was not been on the Isle of Wight, and I said, oh, what about uh, Bill Pertry? He's a good, oh, well, oh, well, we'll give him we'll 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 22 weeks, which is a long time. And the money wasn't bad, you know, more than 360 an hour. And, 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 and I said, why did he said, I'd, I'd like to do it. So I suggested him, and I saw him, and he turned it down. And I saw him in the other room, I said, you've let me down. I would swear, but this boy's here. I, I, I said, you've let me down. I said, I've booked you for the hour. They've booked you for it, and you've let him down. He said, well, he said, the thing is, Felix, I'm going to do a pilot for a show um, all about um, the, the, the uh, la uh, not Land Army, the, uh, the, not um, uh, Home Guard, Home Guard, thank you. Yeah. Home Guard, and uh, I said, you're not, he said, I, I said, you're going to turn 22 week season down to do a one pilot for the BBC, which will run about five minutes. And he said, well, I'm going to take a chance. I'd like to get in a I said, you must be mad. 
but he was right and I was wrong because I could have gone in at that early stage if I'd have done a little bit more creeping. Is that right, Harold? Uh, yes. <laughs> but, um, I, um, I am. I am. I want to tell the truth that I am. I am. I am married, and because uh, I know one or two of you ladies are looking at me, which, uh, but I am. I am married. <laughs> My wife's kinky. She, she said one night, let's make love like cats. So we did, fell off the roof. <laughs> I, 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 I am a granddad. I am a, I'm a very proud of being a granddad. We've got, we got three grandchildren, one of each. A boy, girl, and an hairdresser. But, uh, I, uh, <laughs> but uh, I am a granddad, so I say, I'm very proud of being a granddad. Mind you, being a granddad, it has got its drawbacks. The main drawback is... Is what right past me, I, <laughs> <laughs> I am a grand, I'm, I'm very proud of being a granddad, and, and as I was saying, got his drawback. The main drawback about the granddad, are there any granddads here? Any other granddads here? Because it has got his drawback. The main drawback is you have to sleep with a granny. And I, I was, when, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I was at the BBC not so long ago, um, I, uh, one of our cameramen, well, as I, I've done all the house parties until this last year, and that's why it's a disaster. The director, the producer, the writers, the researchers and myself, our contracts weren't renewed. That was last year. So that's why Noel Edmund Show went round down, because he got rid of the best people who helped him a lot and was very loyal to the man. I'm getting quite cross now. And, uh, and, uh, I should never get one Saturday. I mean, I'll get on And uh, we were... We, I went up to I went up to Scotland with him on the I'm not going too long am I I mean I've been gone for days here but, um, I went up to Scotland with the the house party we used to do Butlins holiday camp and we used to do a special show three audience three thousand uh, uh, people each house uh, and they'd have three audiences so be nine thousand people we play to and uh, I had to go once with him to air and I thought. God, we flew up the, all the way up to here, and I said, "What am I going to do?" They're all Scots. Are there any Scots people here? Any Scots? I was going to say, "Do you want to hear a Scots joke?" <laughs> Get the drinks in. And, and so uh, <laughs> I, said, I went all the way up to here, and I said, "What have I got to do?" To? He said, "I know what you can do. They're all, they're all, they're all." I wonder who was going to sit there. <laughs> he said, uh, um, "I said." Um, what am I going to do? And he said, well, I said, because they're all Scots, and they're all very, all on holiday at Butler's, and 95% would have been all Scots, all of them. And what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Although during the war I was attached to the, uh, the Royal Berkshire Regiment, and then I was attached to the, the Black Watch. So I did have a fair do with, with the Scots. I got on well with them. I did really get on well with them, because I... I didn't used to stick out for myself, but uh, they were funny enough. And uh, but they and I said, what can I do? And the, when the, the red coat said to warm up, I said, you want to do say we're doing pantomime in Trump here. He was a Yorkshire fellow, Lancashire, whatever that sounded like. And he said, um, what you want to do? He said, do some as I do. He said, I do that song about your granny. I said, what's that? He said, well, he, and it came to me. We used to do it. In the, when I was with the Black Watch, we used to do this song, and everybody's, and every, every Scots person, they know it, backwards. And I sang it, and it brought the, and Noel Edmonds come rush. he said, what's all this, what did you do, what did you, what did you do? I said, I'm doing this, what granny song, what granny song? It's a, and, and it went so well, so I'm going to do it for you today, and you've got to do it with me, okay? I could make you do the bob and up and down. I'm, I'm going to do songs, uh, um, um, uh, if, and if, I'll do it first, then you've got to sing it. You promise you'll do it. So start clapping, start clapping. One, two, three, four. So, uh, uh, uh. Oh, you can shove your granny off the bus. Oh, you can shove your granny off the bus. Oh, you can shove your granny, cos she's your mammy's mammy. Oh, you can shove your granny off the bus. Right, we'll all do that. We we'll have the vocals now, and you really got to do it, otherwise I should be on here for another quarter of an hour, and Harold Snow will go home. So when I say one, two, three, start clapping and sing, you know, and that boy there, what is that boy's name? Mark. Well done, Mark, you'll sing it, won't you, Mark? One, two, come on. One, two, three, four. Oh, you can be shove your granny off the bus. Come on. Oh, you can be shove your granny off the bus. Oh, you can't shove your granny, cause she's your mammy's mammy. Oh, you can't shove your granny off the bus. Oh, hey! <laughs> oh, that's worth a round of applause. I was delighted.
disappointed, uh, you, you called me a disappointed, but I was very disappointed that it would be the day at the Grand National. Because you know, I'm into racing, I've got a couple of horses. We've got one running today at Hereford, I don't think it'll win. It's called Storm Tiger, and the, uh, the worst part about it is it's running against a horse I used to own. Uh, 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 until last year, and now it's running against South, and that is called Anne Lace. But uh, I have one going on Monday because I'm quite a wealthy person, uh, you know. Like, I am. I'm, I'm a big overdraft, and, uh, <laughs> and it's called uh, Dancing Dervish, and it should be running on the flat. I can't wait now. It was trained by Stan Miller on Monday, and just have a few bob each way. That's all. I tell people the horses we got interested. I don't own the whole part of fifth of one and tenth of another and a quarter of another. You know what I mean? But, it, but I get all the money back for. Uh, uh, income tax was about advertising to run in mind. No, only one runs in my day, but I do get it back. Yeah, but you understand. but um, I hope you'll uh, have a look at it. I tell you the horses because I don't like them the only one losing money. And, uh, <laughs> but um, I, I was going to say that I don't want to win the lottery because I saw my sister yes, Celeste, yes, 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 I was doing my new will and sorting out things and I said, what happens if I win the lottery? She said, oh please don't win the lottery. Look at the inheritance tax you'll have to pay. So you want to bear that in mind. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure now to introduce you to someone who used me and I mean it in the nicest possible way. Uh, he used me uh, a great deal, and I appreciate all he did. He was one of our top directors, producers, for many, many years. I've known him, ladies and gentlemen, he did Dad's Army, and uh, I always remember in the Dick Every, when, uh, that was all sticks in my mind, because I went filming with uh, Harold and Dick Every. We had some wonderful times together. He's done so many wonderful shows, and he'll tell you what they are. And I wish he was back at the BBC, because all this alternative young comedy stuff, to me, is a load of rubbish. And uh, some of it, some of, and I think if we could get one or two more Dad's Army type things, and, uh, and, and, and Harold Snow's program, we'd do well. So he's worked so hard for your entertainment, and I'm going to ask him to give him a big round of applause, and he's going to have a few words with you today before we see the lottery at the uh, <laughs> <laughs> National at quarter to four. And so, ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for the BBC's Harold Snow. My friend. Because I thought I played 50p and finally got cold. Nice to see you here this afternoon. Um, I don't know how I follow that really. Uh, yes, I have done a great deal at the BBC way back uh, when I was working on Dad's Army. I was actually a production manager at the time with David Croft. Uh, and I found all the original locations, etc. etc. Uh, I worked on it for five years. And in that time, I was also asked by David to direct a certain number of episodes. I think I directed probably no better than I do, actually, because you got it all down. I think seven episodes I, I directed. Uh, and uh, we had a lot of uh, fun doing it, a wonderful bunch of people. Um, idiosyncrasies and characteristics of the actual actors were quite fun. And, well, they were great fun. The um, trouble is that after a time, you can't actually come up with anything particularly that's new to say because everybody knows them, you know, I mean the story is about John Lemez asking me when I told him his watch was wrong or stop would I wind it up for him because he was <laughs> unbelievably casual and lazy about that. I mean I do remember that I did a, uh, uh, when I was doing Dick Henry I did a, one of the things involved as a sort of mystery thing in a, in a big country house and uh, involved the scene with John Lemay, so I actually uh, used this particular episode, and uh, he was lying on uh, a bed in this particular scene, and he was supposed to, uh, he had a revolver which he was pointing at um, Dick, and not exact dialogue, but basically at one point, uh, Dick had to say to him, well, look, where's this particular ring or jewel, whatever it was that it was about? And uh, the action was that he had to bring it out and show it to Dick. And John said to me, well, I can't, yeah? I'm not going to do that. He said, well, you know, I'm holding, a, I'm holding a pistol, yeah? And I said, or revolver. And I said, well, what's the problem? So he said, well, I've got this revolver. So I said, well, you could bring it out with the other hand. And he said, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that was sort of what he was so impractical. I mean, that was why we, when we did the... Uh, 
uh, Ian uh, Lavender in the, in the Bog episode caught in that. The reason that uh, John Lemessa didn't get involved in that at all, and all the business of him getting caught up on the wine etting, was specifically because uh, he was so impractical, we knew that if we actually got him involved in the other bit, it would fail. I mean, he was absolutely useless in that sort of I think everybody knows the story about that episode, I think, with the bog, don't you? With the group cap, with the, yeah, the Stanley thing falling in the water. Yes. It was interesting. Uh, <laughs> the uh, lighthouse thing was quite interesting. That was, uh, put that light out, was actually an idea of mine for that episode. Uh, and uh, we didn't know that much about lighthouses at that time. And uh, Jimmy Perry said to me, we'd better go and find you. Uh, about a bit more about Lighthouse, so I said, okay, fine. So I used to live at Eastbourne years and years ago, I mean, uh, all this, but obviously because of that, I was very conscious and aware of the Head Lighthouse, and it was at sea, and it was handy, so I arranged for Jimmy and I uh, to go down, it was very in advance, to go down, and we'd be taken out to the Lighthouse and give the tour around and all the rest of it, which would help when he came to write the actual script. Uh, and we met up on the day, uh, but would you believe the sea was so rough they couldn't actually take us out, so we never actually got round to see the interior of the lighthouse at all, just based it on the clips and documentaries of what lighthouses are like and all the rest of it. Um, what else can I tell you uh, about that or about the series? I mean, as I say, there's a lot of things. I'm glad you've managed to find some of the locations, Jack and Tony. Um, I think the last one that you asked me about you in Kent, what was that? The Harper Hall, yes, that, that did turn out to be okay, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all the rest of it. I don't know whether David Cross had any reaction to the, his pledge for his pledges, uh, inquiry about lost episodes. I don't think he has. I saw him, I suppose, about three months ago or something like that. And he hadn't had any reaction then, so presumably they still haven't come to life. It's funny actually because about three of the episodes are the ones that I directed. What are they trying to tell me something else? <laughs> <laughs> but you never know, they might come to life in Australia or somewhere like that. There are some very strange things that have, have come to life sort of 30 years, 35 years later. I mean, kids programs that have been discovered in the vaults of all sorts of things. Uh, I don't know why it's children's programs, but perhaps they thought, oh well these are too old for us, so we'll put them away and they discovered 35 years later or something. But uh, there you go. Um, now, what I've been asked to do today, uh, which I hope you'll find interesting, uh, is there was a series, which was a, a knock-on. So as you know, I, myself and Michael Noah wrote, we wrote a, a vast number of the Dad's Army episodes for radio, which in itself was not too difficult at the beginning because when you're just having organizing, uh, getting troops together and that sort of thing, uh, it isn't that difficult to convert it to radio. Uh, as the series went on, it became that much more difficult because obviously the whole project became that much more visual. Uh, I have a lot of their exploits were tied up with visual movers, which took a bit more adapting for radio. And in fact, adapting would be the wrong word. It was a lot of rewriting was required to make them work on radio. And there came a point when we'd sort of done well, what BBC wanted, which was 60, I think, or 65, or whatever it is, you probably know. 67, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the one or two that we knew we wouldn't do, for example, Gorilla Warfare, had you actually on the radio established as a gorilla behind you, or indeed uh, my brother and I, whatever it is, how do you establish that it's, you know, you can do it vocally, but it's not as easy. Uh, and, you know, when we'd done the 67, that was uh, sort of it, you know. And we'd already had problems with Jimmy Beck dying and that sort of thing. <coughs> cast that. And we uh, recorded them in Paris uh, cinema in Regent Street and then we went on to do it at the Playhouse. Uh, and, you know, they were very, very popular. And thank God, why they aren't repeated now, heaven only knows. I've asked the BBC why they don't do it. I said it's ideal sort of listening at 6.30 in the evening, people coming home in their cars, something like that, to come in on the car radio. Why not? I mean, the television series have proved to be unbelievably successful, but not uh, the radio. But uh, they said, uh, the last response was a few months ago, no, we don't want to do that. We don't want to take anything that was, comes from television. So they then proceeded to do some radio versions of uh, Bob Larby things and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, yes, but that's story. Still, there you go. Um, anyway, uh, when we'd finished doing the uh, that's not the radio. So I got an idea uh, about doing something, well, in fairness with Michael, but I had this one idea, which, uh, of um, 
doing something based on a peer and being set uh, two or three years after the war. And uh, Mannering coming back to this country, being out of the country uh, with Elizabeth because she had a problem with uh, the thrones and whatnot. She'd been to Switzerland for a couple of years. That was plot wise necessary, so he didn't know what was happening. And he came back and wanted, uh, found that the pier down the coast of Framborn was actually likely to be demolished. And he suddenly thought that he could actually save it. Uh, and I won't tell you the rest of the ramifications of this fairly obvious, I'm sure, because anybody who's heard the, the knock-on series of that will know. Uh, he actually went to, well, I will tell you, he actually went to the bank to get a, a loan and was horrified to discover that, he's, that Wilson had actually moved down the coast and was now the manager and was actually asked, happy to ask his, his ex-chief clerk for a loan. Um, and I remember we wrote this, I wrote this at night and whatnot, and I got in touch with Arthur and said, uh, would you like to read this, Arthur? And we were, we were great friends and had been for <coughs> years, you know, well, since death, and he said, yeah, yeah. So um, I went down to see him uh, on his boat, the Amazon, which he happened to be at the time, which in itself was actually quite a funny session. I got down there and he was thrilled to bits because they were doing some reworking on this thing. They were re putting in new loos, which were called heads on the boat. And uh, they were painting it and whatnot, and it was in this dike near Twickenham. And uh, he said, oh yes, he said, I'll take you around, I'll show you what they're doing. One of them was we walked past, they were the old heads on the grass bird. And he said, there's the old one, he said, the new loos are on board. And he said, uh, oh, and it's wonderful, I'll take you around. And he took me on board, you see, and it was great. And uh, whilst I was with him, and he was putting the kettle on around a cup of tea and he said, uh, somebody, one of the, the painters who were doing the port side of the boat came up and said, uh, oh, Mr. Lowe, he said, we want to take the boat out and turn it round so that we can paint the other side. Uh, so we need to uh, reverse it down into the main river and uh, turn it round and bring it up the dike the other way. Well, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. What do you think, Harold? Uh, yeah, fine, it's fine. I think. Right, yes, we'll come with you, he said. Right, okay. So we're on this boat, and it goes out in the middle. And suddenly the engine fails. <laughs> we are stuck in the middle of the main river. It's quite a long boat, stuck in the middle of the main river, and it doesn't go forward, backwards, or anything. We're holding up all the rest of the traffic and all the rest of it. And he is fueled. Whoa! I mean, I can't use the language. I mean, it wasn't as bad as it would be nowadays, but then nevertheless, it was fairly strong. I don't really know what they're doing. This is ridiculous. And it was quite ludicrous anyway. We were there in the middle of the river for about three quarters of an hour, and then finally they got a rowing boat out and tied two or three lines together and eventually pulled the thing round the other way and got it into back into the dike. But uh, he was very critical, never employ them again, and all this went on. Which uh, is quite funny. Anyway, that same afternoon I said to him, Have you calmed down? So, yes. Oh, yes, yes, he said, You were going to talk to me about it. So I came up with this. Um, this idea, you see, and I talked to him about it, and he said to me, oh, that's very good. I said, well, it's more than an idea, we've actually written it. So, um, he said, uh, really? So I said, yes. Um, but uh, I said, I'll leave you with a script. So he said, yeah, all right, fine. Okay. So I left him with a script, and he rang me about 24 hours later, and he said, yes, it's very good indeed. At that time, we'd written it as a radio script, because we were knocking that from Dan's on the radio. So I don't think we ought to do it on radio, we ought to do it on television. Ridiculous. It's very good. Let's do it on television. So I said, well, all right, I'll try. Oh, he said, oh, by the way, he said, I've rung up John. He's an idiot as well. Very keen indeed. So I said, oh, fine. So um, I've got in touch with the BBC. Hello. <coughs> so you can't argue. So I went back to Arthur and said, no, I'm sorry, it's going to have to be a radio series. So he said, oh, well, all right, I suppose, you know. So we, um, we made this first, uh, this pilot, um, which went very well. Slightly strange uh, producer. I mean, whether you're in radio, television, or anything else, uh, you don't rule the writers out if you're in television. I was in television for a hell of a number of years. At the read through of, the of any episode of a script, whether it be Don't Mind Up, maybe the Twisty Circle, whatever it is, the King Gun Prince, all things like that, the Bond Boys Battle, it's all things like that, um, you know, the writer attends and is there. Uh, and the same thing when we did the Dad's Army, we were always there. Uh, at the radio side and whatnot, you have the first read through and then uh, you stay there while they're rehearsing, etc. 
And then when you arrive at the Paris Cinema to record this the rehearsal, they record this um, pilot of it, sticks out half a mile, and the producer, a strange gentleman, a uh, band reminder and I from the read through. He said, No, you sit outside, he said, I don't want you inside. And Michael and I were discussing it very recently. I couldn't understand it this day, why? He did that, totally unheard of. Anyway, we, they went and had the read through and there was no problems. And they recorded it and uh, it went very well. We had a little bit of trouble with Arthur because he did have, I can never remember what it's called, it's that disease that starts with M, makes you doze off, what's it called? Not never feed yet. Something anyway, we're getting with there and you tend to, what? I can't remember this, but anyway, so he did doze off a couple of times uh, during the re recording. And uh, with, normally in a radio recording, if they not do it, when they sit down. The trouble was he dozed off and we had to wake him up before he came back. <laughs> but anyway, we did it, and um, it was deemed to be, by the powers that be, yes, very successful, and uh, we'll go for a series. And we got uh, 10 episodes of the one. So we said, uh, no, yeah, yeah, I think it was 10 episodes, yeah. So we said, fine. And then, of course, the next news we had, Michael and I had started writing and had written the first after the original pilot, the second, third episode, when of course Arthur died, which was uh, obviously for the personal basis was very bad news, but also was not terribly good news as far as the series was concerned. And uh, we thought, well, that's it. So we went to uh, some artists in the field to memorial service for Arthur, which was very well attended. And on the way out, Joan, his wife, grabbed hold of me and she said, You must, you must continue that idea. Arthur thought it was absolutely wonderful. You must find another way of doing it. He'd want you to do that. Please, please do find another way of doing it. So we came out, Michael and I went home, and I came up with the idea of involving Bill and, uh, and uh, Ian, and uh, we made the ten episodes. And then, as you probably know, uh, John died, which is really quite extraordinary. Uh, I mean, fate, <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, we'd already been commissioned to write three other episodes, which I was still got to have three episodes which were never recorded, obviously. Thankfully, we weren't paid for them because uh, <laughs> not my fault, but to the job, right? Uh, and um, that's the history of that. Actually, it didn't quite the history of that because a few years later, um, I decided, and this is a very strange track record for a thing about a peer, I decided it might be quite a good idea to use the basic idea of the peer for a television thing. So uh, I wrote uh, a thing called uh, Walking the Planks, which was a pilot which starred Richard Wilson and Michael Elphick, and went out on BBC One just as a one-off pilot and was very well received. I got it got sort of eleven and a half million for a pilot, which nowadays up and running comedy is <coughs> lucky if you get seven. Uh, so for our first episode, it was, was very high, and uh, it seemed to go down very well with the public. I went to the BBC and said, you know, want to make any more? No, I don't think so. No. No, I don't think so. Why? And I said, well, it seemed to go down. No, no I don't think so. So I then said, uh, well, I reserve, can I reserve the right? I, mean, I was fairly senior producer director at those times. I said, can I reserve the right to sell it elsewhere? And they said, uh, yeah, 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 fine. Uh, and within a week, a week I sold it to the Auto Television. I didn't know what I was letting myself in for, the reason I was playing the moment, but I sold it to the Auto Television. This news got back to the BBC, and I got a phone call from the Director General himself saying, Look, Gaddy, you are going to do this project on uh, uh, ITV. Look, I must ask you, Harold, I mean, uh, we can't have one of our senior producer directors uh, writing a programme for. Uh, ITV with his own name, so please, I'd be very grateful if you would actually change it and write under a pseudonym. So, I didn't fall out of BBC, my employer, so I said, Yes, okay, fine. So, it was written under the name of Alan Sherwood and Michael Knowles. Uh, and then I discovered, and this was the last bit of this I'll bore you with, uh, that when we did it in Yorkshire Television, and it was in fact with Bernard Cribbins and Richard Wilson, and we did seven episodes. I was horrified to discover, despite the fact that the thing was being set on a pier, which is being called High and Dry, uh, they actually didn't want to do any location work at all. Absolutely none. Here is something that was set on a pier, and if, when I did it down uh, on the Isle of Wight, when I did the original one, I mean, had I carried on, I'd have certainly done the location work on the pier. 
It's like saying I do the whole of Dad's Army inside the whole, you know, inside the studio. You can't. Uh, and, but you've got, you know, when you're on a pier, you have a wind, you have the horizons, you have seagulls, you have everything you expect to see at sea. Boats passing, God knows what. And yet they wanted to do the whole thing in studio uh, in Leeds. And as a result of that, uh, it didn't fare awfully well. I mean, it was wasn't criticised on good as comedic value, but it, they did get a lot of letters saying this is like watching a program, a children's hour program. Why are the sets are obviously sets and not out on location? And there's an interesting little tag to this that in those days we used to have our program in the morning on BBC. I can't remember what it was, but it was actually called, but it was all about watching the television and what was on. And Richard Wilson and I uh, were asked to go on this and talk about this series. So I got back on the Director General. I said, well, they've now asked me to go on because they're criticising ITV for the fact that the whole thing was studio-bound. Uh, do you want me to go on there as I'm in Sherwood? That was my real name. <laughs> and he said, oh, no, he said, you better go on as your real name. And uh, so I went on this open air. Was called, that's what I, I went on this programme and uh, talked with Richard Wilson. We were on it for about three an hour with Eamon Holmes and, uh, and answering questions. And they had about 2,000 people who rang in and said that they thoroughly enjoyed the programme, but why was the whole thing... Uh, you know, and the whole reason was, a matter of interest, is that they had a strange <coughs> union rules over there. They couldn't actually go away and stay away uh, involving the weekend. So if they took their electricians, they were very, very union bound, if they took their electricians down to um, the coast, shall we say, they had to travel on a Monday and they would say that they couldn't film and travel the same day. So they started on the Tuesday. And if it was a long and far enough, for example, on either one, they would have started on the Wednesday. Uh, and then they do one day's filming and because they had to be back home for, for Saturday, Sunday, they then start off again. So in f uh, five days, they would do one day's filming, which of course is absolutely no way to run a television channel. Fortunately, not quite so bad now. They're lucky they've got to work at all. But anyway, there you go. So um, that's you know the whole thing of, of the peer project right the way through. But as far as this um, particular, my being here today, you obviously have all heard at some time. I mean, I've actually got all the copies of the original. Um, it sticks out half a mile with John and Ian and all the rest of it. But I am, well, I think Michael and he just got one as well. But Michael and I are the only people in the world, because uh, even BBC don't have it, uh, has the original pilot. And uh, I was uh, asked to come down here today and bring that down so you can have a listen. As long as there are no other devices in here, which are actually going to be recorded. No? Right? Everybody be present? <laughs> 